The Tour de France isn't everyone's cup of tea, but it is currently home to the world's best riders. And it turns out they know a thing or two about riding bikes. So who better to go to in order to see what cycling tech is taking off, what saddles and gearing they choose for 3,405 kilometers of hell, and if there's anything that me or you can copy to make us faster, or more comfortable on the bike. For years, it's been almost expected that a pro's bike is slammed, with the stem as low as possible in what sometimes appears to be a competition of who can get the biggest drop between their bars and saddle. However, when wandering around the bikes this year, it's notable that not everyone is still buying into this game. Oh yes, whilst a lower front end is arguably faster over short distances, thanks to lowering your body and hence reducing your frontal area, Speed is fairly pointless in the Tour de France, or any long ride really, if it's unsustainable. Many riders this year have a good few spaces under their stems, and we reckon that without the same stretching and conditioning as the pros, most of our bikes should forgo the super aggressive look too, in favour of actual real world performance and comfort. Actually, most of our riding is probably better suited to an endurance road bike, so if you haven't yet watched our endurance bike versus rates bike vid, then you can use the link up there. Every year we say that tyres are the widest they've ever been and well guess what we're gonna say it again. We saw the vast majority of road bikes being ridden at the 2023 Tour de France and who'd like to guess the very smallest tyre size that we saw? Nope not 23mm, not even 25mm but 26mm. That was a tubular tyre on Team Astana's Coromers. The majority of riders though are using 28mm rubber and we also spotted this set of 30mm tractor tyres on Matteo Trentin's spare bike. Just because a 23mm tyre might feel faster as you rattle your way down our less than perfect road surfaces, it doesn't necessarily mean it is. It's about time we copied the pros and rode wide rubber. Did you know that derailleurs were first seen in the 1937 Tour de France, some 86 years ago? You would have thought then that the big players, Shimano, Schramm and Campagnolo, would have worked out how to keep chains on chain rings. The peloton, despite having the best mechanics in the world, are clearly less than convinced that this is the case. Walk around the team buses and you'll see chain catchers being used more than EPO in the 90s, and that's no mean feat. K-Edge's design is present across plenty of teams, including Bora Hansgrohe and Quickstep, whilst Dylan Gronewegen goes for this Fourier's catcher. There's very few downsides to using a chain catcher, they don't exactly weigh a lot and can be picked up for not a lot of cash. Would you add around 12 grams to your bike for the additional peace of mind, or have you had any chain suck nightmares? Let us know in the comments section below, and if you haven't already, then please subscribe to the channel as it really does help us make content like this. Tubeless is a debate that continues to rage on, and while some of us are fans, there's plenty of arguments to say that there's some way to go before we all ditch the inner tubes. The pro peloton is also seemingly having this invisible debate. Bora Hansgrohe told us that on dry stages, they choose to use the Clincher S-Works Turbo Cotton with latex inner tubes, whereas for wet stages, they switch to tubeless, the S-Works Rapid Air tyre to be precise. This is replicated across the other specialised teams, Total Energies and Sudal Quickstep. However, most other teams seem to have transitioned to tubeless for the majority of stages. EF, UAE, Jumbo Visma and Ineos all have the telltale tubeless valves. The conclusion is that sometimes tubeless is better, and at other times there's no point. Now let's stop hating on our fellow riders just because they make slightly different life choices to ours. Ever wondered what cogs the pros are riding? Well, if you're on the bike with a Shimano group set, then it appears to nearly always be a 5440 at the front and an 1134 at the rear. Why not use smaller cogs at both the front and rear? Well, not only does this combo give more top end speed, but teams also reckon it improves chain line as riders will more often be riding in the middle of the block and hence reducing drivetrain watt losses. SRAM kicked up quite the storm when it announced its chain rings would top out at 5037, even though when combined with a 10 tooth sprocket at the back, it gave a bigger gear than full size rings and an 11 tooth sprocket. Since then, SRAM has given in and made pro level chain sets in sizes 5239, 5441 and a massive 5643, so that anyone wanting to push a bigger gear can. Most of the pros from Jumbo Visma and Movistar that we spotted are on the 5239 tooth option. Now, we're not for a moment saying that you should go out and copy these exact ratios. For most of us, that would be absolutely insane. However, you should tailor your gearing choices to the terrain you're riding, just like the pros. A comfortable cadence is not only more efficient, 
but can also save those joints and potential back soreness. This next one isn't necessarily tech and more the lack of it. It wasn't until we had a chat in the office that we realized how antiquated stem stickers are. And whilst it's a solution that clearly works, we are surprised that tech hasn't taken their place. Even though cycling computers now have the ability to remind you to eat and drink, the pros still love their stem stickers. And this goes to show how important fueling is on the bike. Eating and drinking enough on the bike will make a far bigger difference to your riding performance than just about any expensive upgrade out there. So whether you go paperless or make your own stem sticker to remind you to fuel, just make sure you do. The Peloton is normally reluctant to try new things, being a bunch of traditionalists. However, short nose saddles are one of those creations that have seemingly come out of nowhere and now are everywhere. Just about every saddle brand out there offers saddles in both long and short varieties, and riders get the whole range to choose from. This year, most riders are going for the short ones. Short nose saddles aren't for everyone, but if you want to ride fast in an aggressive position, then a shorter saddle could allow your pelvis to roll forwards more, making getting lower easier. A few years ago, there was black insulation tape being stuck around all over the place to hide non-sponsor components. But the current generation of riders are either a lot less fussy about their kit, more well-behaved, or of course, the sponsors have listened and actually created kit that the riders want. Wandering around, we struggled to find many things that would anger team sponsors at all. This physique saddle was spotted on Jayco Alula's Giant Propel for Going Giant's own brand Kdex, and Campanarts opted for a sizable rotor chainring over Shimano. It's during the TTs that the bikes get unchained, and in particular, this AeroCoach Aox Zephyr and Titan front wheel seems to be a popular choice, despite AeroCoach not being the official wheel sponsor of any team. The whopping 100mm deep front wheels aren't exactly light at over a kilo, but as we know, aerodynamics rule supreme. And AeroCoach says that this is the fastest front wheel it's ever tested. Plenty of teams are clearly buying into it. We also spotted the small British brand AeroCoach's rear wheel in action. Take a look at this weird embossed section around the cassette area. If you take a look around any Tour de France team's bikes, then you'll soon see that no two of them are the same. Separate from special paint jobs, you'll notice that every rider has a different stem length, handlebar width, and of course, saddle height. And this isn't just because the team got sent some random assortment of components from their suppliers. The fit of your bike will make a far bigger difference to your comfort, technical ability, and performance than you might think. So it's well worth investing some time in, just like the pros do. There's all sorts of books, YouTube videos, and articles available on the RoadCC website for fine tuning your fit or of course you could invest in a bike fit. A good one doesn't come cheap, but it could be money well spent. I love being a bit of a weight weenie, changing bolts for lighter ones, finding lighter bottle cages and so on. However, if you're doing it in the pursuit of speed, then I'm afraid it's going to make very, very minimal difference. The priority for the Tour de France pros is no longer getting the lightest bike possible, not because it's impossible to get a disc brake bike down to 6.8 kilos, but rather the aero sacrifices that have to be made to do it. Pro riders love deep wheels, integrated cockpits, and aero frames so much that they're prepared to lug around an extra few hundred grams for the three weeks. Now that is commitment. Even though me and you travel a lot slower than the pros, we can still learn a thing or two from them. Most of our rides are unlikely to take in the same huge mountains or elevation, and we're also out in the wind for much longer, so aero is still important. It is always worth remembering though that between 70 and 80% of your drag comes from your body, not your equipment. So maybe that's food for thought. Will you be copying any of these Tour de France tech trends? Let us know in the comment section below. If you haven't already, then please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel for lots more tech tips and tests that put the latest gear through their paces. We'll see you next time.